We are the Cat's Whiskers, and this is my top line. Hello and welcome to another edition of My Top Line. I'm John O'Bullard and I'm delighted to say we've got a television and radio star with us for choosing his Panthers top line. This time, I'm delighted to welcome Chris Ellis. Oh, I'm not sure about that, but no, Johnny, <laughs> thanks for having me on. It, it's great. And hey, this is one of the hardest things I've had to do in a while, as you'll probably find out. So thanks for asking me. Really, really honoured you have. No, it's great to have you on. And it's funny you say that. We've had some people who've been able to choose their team in seconds and then others who, who've really spent a long time over it so you're definitely not on your own there mate brilliant and, and yeah and and, and as, as you probably heard from other people i changed my mind many times but then you know you just have to zone in and, and, and think of the many reasons why you want to pick that that line so no it was great fun it was a great test you set me yeah. so it's a nottingham panthers line and moments that you've chosen uh, so when did you start going to watch the Panthers? Well, you know, my, my memory's not great the older I get, as it, as it happens to us all. I, I mean, I, I went as a kid very rarely, maybe once a season, twice a season, perhaps perhaps once every couple of years. Maybe in the mid-90s, I would say I probably went early 90s, probably went maybe seven or eight times. Sometimes with, with, with my mum and dad, I remember once going, something to do with my, my dad's work, he got invited so there was that there was that very small hospitality box at one end of the rink of the old ring, wasn't there? Yeah. Uh, and I have very vague recollection, recollections of me and dad and, and my mom sat in there. And, and we a couple of times went as a family, maybe in the, in the mid 90s. It was that thing where, you know, it, it was hard to get tickets or, you know, there's certainly the myth, you know, whether it was a myth or whether it was true. There was there was times when it was really hard to get tickets. But But then that kind of brings me on to sort of later on and, and and when i started to kind of go regularly and take a massive interest was was the final season of the of the old ice stadium was when i started to to buy tickets and go every week and and i would say that i kind of went semi regularly in the first part and then in, in in the sort of back end of that last season always managed to get tickets in in the corner you know the, the seats weren't even facing the ice were they right in the in the corner near where the away fans are yes um and, and only on the front row i think and and I, you know again i can't even remember how we got them did we buy them online in that era maybe not maybe went down and uh, genuinely it, it's too long ago but i just remember sort of going with friends and, and going to about nine or ten matches to the end of the season and then being quite gutted that i never made it to the final game because you know i've been working at radio nottingham for, for quite a while, you know, I started as, a, as an 11-year-old kid answering phones and making tea. Uh, and, and one of the jobs I still do is, is work in the studio as a, as a producer. Uh, and that night of the final game, um, I remember desperately wanting to go, but Radio Nottingham wanted me to work in the studio. I think Colin Frey went with, with Robin Chipperfield, perhaps, who presented. Colin, pretty sure, would have commentated. Uh, and, yeah, I worked in the studio. But So, so the, the, the love of ice hockey was always there, but it was that final season of, of the old rink where I went from going, you know, maybe two or three times a year to, to, to pretty regularly and buying single game tickets. You mentioned Radio Nottingham there. Of course, you became the Panthers correspondent for Radio Nottingham. Uh, mm -hmm. And you, you've done that on and off right up till the present day. So how did that yeah. come about? Well, well, that kind of it's where the story naturally leads on. Uh, I remember at the time, at the end of that season, the move into the, the National Ice Centre uh, obviously, I'd got quite hooked, and it was it was like, want to buy a season ticket for this? You know, there's going to be plenty of season tickets available in the big building. Uh, and then Colin Frey pulled me to one side one day and said, "I'm not going to be able to do Panthers now." In, in those days, I think, oh, again, it, it's hard for me to, to pinpoint dates, but maybe Colin and, and Martin Fisher only did second half commentary on, on Forest. Of course, Colin Frey, who, who now is very established as, 
as the long-time Forest correspondent on, on Radio Nottingham and the sports editor there. Anyway, but the bottom line was Colin was unable to dedicate the time to the Panthers uh, that he used to be able to due to his commitments to being a sports editor of the station and, of course, covering Forest. So he said, would you like to, to cover them? Uh, and, you know, that what a great conversation to have. The year you wanted to buy a season ticket, you were now going to cover the team. And, of course, I said yes. And that's where it really all started. You know, I, I stepped away for a while, uh, never stepped away from Radio Nottingham, really, but stepped away covering from, from the Panthers because I, I became the Elite League press officer for a while and the manager at the time didn't feel it was right that I could be Elite League press officer and cover the Panthers for the Radio Nottingham. Saw that as a bit of a conflict of interest, mm. but um, no longer do the the Elite League uh, stuff. And, and and obviously Radio Nottingham, it kind of tied in well without boring with the story. Radio Nottingham felt they wanted to increase their coverage again, which had probably, since Owen Bradley had left, had, had kind of gone by the wayside. And, and, and that worked out quite well. So that's where it started to do a lot more coverage on the Panthers for Radio Nottingham again this season, just gone. And then, of course, free sports as well. So you are regularly part of the Elite League coverage on free sports. So uh, how did that one come about? Well, that's really... That that all started with, with Sky Sports. Yeah. When, when I left Radio Nottingham, when, when you know, I decided that I would no longer be Panthers correspondent with Radio Nottingham and try and take up some other opportunities with the Elite League, which eventually led to the, to the Great Britain work, which, you know, in Ice Hockey UK, which is fantastic. Um, the, the core came in from from James Mitchell uh, and Dave Sims. James Mitchell was a producer who you, you know, uh, and, and Simsy, of course, was was the presenter uh, and, and, you know, asked me to do some ringside reporting. I can't remember whether they called me. I might have even given them a call and said, look, I'm available uh, now. Uh, and, and that kind of worked. You know, that that was for many years until the, the Sky program stopped. And then when the free sports program started up a couple of three years ago again and a conversation with with premier sports free sports and, and aaron murphy uh, and that brought that one again so it was again after a gap of i don't know four or five years after sky coverage ended it, it's been fantastic and and what a pleasure because I, I worked with paul as a coach when he was coach in nottingham and and obviously i was reporter for radio nottingham that that friendship uh, and, and relationship continued he then did a few games as summarizer for me uh, for radio nottingham when he had left and, and gone to work in Italy and, and other places, uh, and now we work together on, on free sports, which is which is brilliant. Alongside the, the fantastic and you know Aaron Murphy, the passion Aaron shows is, is great. They're a great combination to to work with. And as I think I've seen you mention, because you've as yourself, uh, I couldn't hear Murph there, <laughs> Jono. You, you've had the, the lucky, you know, been lucky to, to work with AD. And when you work with a a guy that you has been a hero when you've watched from afar, and then got close up it's been fantastic so you know it's been a great great few years covering the sport and i'm very lucky indeed okay well we'll crack on with your team and as ever you've picked a netminder two defensemen three forwards also your favorite game favorite goal favorite opposition players who never played for the panthers we'll have a few honorable mentions and as always we'll end the show with your favorite moment but we'll go back to the start and it's your netminder. So, Chris, who is the netminder you've chosen? Well, I think many would probably think Craig Kowalski, and that's the simple selection, isn't it? Because he was fantastic and lasted so long, longer than any of the netminder for the Panthers. But I'm going to go for a different one, and, and you'll find out the reason soon. But that's Jordan Willis. Jordan Willis, two seasons for the Panthers, 99-2000, the last season at the old Ice Stadium, and the first season at the NIC, 2000-2001. 105 games in the old Super League. He also was a draft for the Dallas Stars, 243 overall in round 10 in 1993. And he did ice one game for them in the 0304 season. So Chris, why particularly Jordan Willis? It's it's part of my story really from from watching as a fan to becoming a reporter and Jordan was obviously the netminder in that final season in the in the old barn uh, and obviously the season where I really got hooked on ice hockey. And then he was the the netminder the next season in the uh, in the new era in the new barn of course at the National Ice Centre. He's, he's never going to be the best netminder Nottingham Panthers ever had, but he, I felt if I talk about it from a playing side, 
in that era, Nottingham weren't a great side. Yes, we had some great play for us, and we're going to talk about some more of them, you know, before we finish. But we didn't spend the money that uh, <clears throat> Sheffield probably did, and and and, <laughs> and teams like that, uh, you know, and that's that's no secret in that era. Certainly, it's changed in the current day. But in that era, Neil, Neil Black took over a club that was on its knees, and he was frugal in his early days, and it paid dividends because the club is now the strongest club, probably in the whole of the elite league or right up there with, with some of the, you know, the big franchises there. Uh, so, you know, basically Jordan Willis, I felt I loved his style. I loved to watch him play. He gave Nottingham a chance to win every night. I felt even in a team that, that wasn't that great. But, but one of the reasons I kind of wanted to, to name him was again, at the start of my reporting journey, you, you meet ice hockey players and 99% of them are brilliant. That they, they, they're helpful, you know, in the job that I do, you have to rely on them to be accommodating and, and 99% of them have. There's a few, there's a couple who I could probably put down and say they were not so welcoming and, and a pain in the bum, but that's, that's the same in any sport. But, you know, it brings me to the story about Jordan Willis, the first day as a reporter. So the first time I was going to cover the Panthers, it was preseason. Colin Fred sent me down and said, I want you to get some preseason interviews. They'll go on power play on, on a Saturday afternoon. And I wandered down the, the NIC and I was very nervous. I mean, what was I then? It was 19, well, 2000. So I was 23 something like that, 22, 23, so very wet behind the ears. And, and I turned up and, and walked down the corridor, and I saw this chap, and, and, I, and I didn't really know who it was because I hadn't really, wouldn't really know what Jordan Willis looked like because before I'd seen him behind his face cage, you know, or behind his mask, uh, should I say, you know, with a, uh, you know, as in being the, the net mind, not somebody in that area, you probably, wasn't lots of pictures on the internet and, and stuff like that. Um, but anyway, I saw this chap. And I said, oh, I'm Chris from, from Radio Nottingham. I'm here to do some interviews. And he just said, I'm Jordan Willis. I'm the, I'm the goalie. Uh, come with me. I'll take you down to the dressing room and, and I'll introduce you to everyone. And, and, and that was fantastic because there's a nervous 23-year-old who, who was really apprehensive about going to interview these sports stars. And I've probably barely done a, a sporting interview at that stage. And he, and, he, and he said, come down. And he introduced me and, and, and said, look, this is Chris from Radio Nottingham. And the guys in the room said, hi, I think I did an interview with Jordan that day and, and someone else. But, but that stuck with me, its friendliness. And then that was a pattern that was replicated throughout my, you know, and continue to this day. You know, the, the way 99% of hockey players are so accommodating is fantastic. But, but that's kind of a, a sort of start of my journey. And, and Jordan Willis was, was right there. I remember Jordan Willis quite well. And I think we've had better netminders. I think we've had more consistent netminders. But I think one of the things that Jordan Willis could do was pull out an impossible save, often at really important parts of games. And, and absolutely. And that's what I mean. He, he gave Panthers a chance to win in a team that it just wasn't that great. Sure, it had some NHL superstars in there and some old favourites, but it never had a, nowhere near the depth of that that Sheffield team that, that won everything that year, but he, he just gave Nottingham a, a chance to win. Uh, and I remember thinking that, you know, end of his first year, I thought, well, he'll be back. Of course, he never did. You know, he only spent two seasons. I mean, his career wasn't that long, was it? When you look at his stats and everything, it, 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 you feel it should have lasted a lot longer. He only played a season after, after yeah. playing for the Panthers. You're right. He, he could pull off a wonderful save. And, and yeah, in, in a poor side, you know, he gave Nottingham that, that chance. And, and as I say, he was at the start of that journey for me. So Jordan Willis is your netminder. We're going to move on next to your first defenseman. So, Chris, who is defenseman number one? It's Jimmy Pack. Jimmy Pack from the same team as Jordan Willis in that first season at the NIC, 2000-2001. Came back towards the end of the 2001-2002 season and then was also there for the 2002-2003 season, all in the Super League. Of course, Pack was a two-time Stanley Cup winner with the Pittsburgh Penguins in 1991 and 1992. He played 123 games for the Panthers in all competitions, scoring six goals and 42 assists. Now, Chris, Jimmy's been chosen a couple of times already uh, in previous shows. So why Jimmy Pack for you? I mean, he's almost one of the first names in my team. And I mean, it's Jimmy Pack. The guy was a class act on and off the ice. He he was fantastic to watch. He was so smooth to watch as a skater. He never looked flustered. 
you know, you remember the excitement when Nottingham signed him, a two-time NHL champion. You know, and you, you were forgiven for thinking that a guy who'd done all that might be arrogant and a lot of sports stars you know some are arrogant but they they put it off in a in a way that that's not too disrespectful some people are just downright cocky and and rude but but jimmy pack was none jimmy pack was was a gentleman and anyone who came across him within hockey or you know away from the away from hockey I've, i've worked in hockey a long time and wherever i've been you know, I've never had a, a heard a, a bad word to say about Jimmy Pack. Again, I, I'll put my reporter's hat on. Uh, another guy who was a dream. You know, I remember the first time I went to interview him, I was nervous. This was Jimmy Pack. You know, no disrespect to Jordan Willis. I mean, what you know, this was a, a legend in, in my eyes. It was just, I don't know, it was an honor to watch him play. I've kept in touch with him since he's left. I've had the honor of seeing him twice since... Uh, once in his homeland of Korea, when I when I was, in fact, you were there too, Jono. Uh, I was, yes, and, uh, yeah. Uh, we we had in, a slight uh, crossover, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, we had a slight crossover of a couple of days <laughs> in, in in the venue there uh, in Korea, and uh, got to see Jimmy uh, and Courtney and the family again there. And I interviewed him actually uh, on the on the radio for Five Live Sports Extra. On, on a night when GB women were playing in that Olympic venue, of course, which was the, the venue for the Winter Olympics. But, but again, Jimmy w- was probably the, the best player on, on a team that, again, I'll go back to it, it, you know, it wasn't that great, certainly in his first year. I'm just really sad that Jimmy never won in Nottingham. I really wish Jimmy had, you know, he ended his career here. I think every, every fan on every team would wanted to see Jimmy Jimmy play. Uh, you know, he, he played in that crazy team, didn't he? Um, Jason Clark, Dodie Wood, yes, Scott uh, Allison, Scott that, uh, Allison, and uh, Christian Tauber. You know, he, he, I mean, he was almost the um, least hard nut on the team. But that's not to say that Jimmy wouldn't stand down from a battle because he always would. So yeah, what Jimmy maybe privately thought of that team when they were crazy brow broading around every other night, I, I don't know. But um, but no, Jimmy just a class act on and off the ice, and and it, I say bumped into him a few times since and he and he's been a gentleman and just a, a great player and you know we we you know we won't see many better D men in my opinion to ever play in this country. I think the thing with Jimmy Pack as well is as as we've moved on it's now what seventeen years since he last played oh, for us, believe yeah. it or not, when you think about it. But he's still a player who is is revered almost. He's mentioned several times, even among Newer fans who never saw him play, they still know who Jimmy Pack is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I know the club keeping you know, close contact with him. And he's been back, hasn't he, a couple of times in that period. And he's dropped the puck. And, you know, and, and that shows, you know, you, you look at where this, this legend has played all around the world in, in the best leagues in the world. Yet, yet he chooses to come back to Nottingham and, and he's been back more than once. Um, and you only need to hear him talk. It's a genuine affection. I remember doing the interview with him uh, high up in that arena in, in Korea, in the Olympic venue. And, and he said, I love Nottingham. And, and you know, and, and not the only player to say that. But when someone of Jimmy Pack's stature says that, it, it's really special indeed. And as I say, I, I wish we could have seen him play for longer. And I wish he could have won. Uh, and would he maybe one day be Panthers coach? With no disrespect to the organisation, has he now gone on to bigger and, and better things you know he's he's coached in the AHL hasn't he? he's been assistant coach in the NHL he's, he's now taken South Korea on a, on a fantastic journey but but you never know what the future holds you know maybe how old Jimmy now he must be in his early 50s so still time for him to come back one day and, and that'd be amazing if he was to coach this club absolutely it would OK, we're going to leave your team for a second and move on to your favourite game. But before we do, let's have a listen to this. Kadot just holds it up and holds it up, gives it to Stanchok. Stanchok back to Kadot at the left defensive position, back to Stanchok at right defence. Now it's with Thompson advancing into the offensive zone at right wing. Thompson's pass comes to the back stick. It's wide open it is. and the Panthers have won it with Kim Howroos. It came to the back. So... After listening to that, Chris, reveal what your favourite game is. Well, it's not hard to, to say. That's a Challenge Cup final, of course, of 2004. The overtime winner from, from Kim Aarhus. I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about my emotions on that one. But uh, the, the funny story is that version you've just played to music, 
is the only version uh, of, the, of the game at the moment, of that game-winning goal uh, that we have. Uh, one or two sort of corruption problems in the BBC archive of that game unfortunately means that, that that game at the moment is unavailable. Hopefully one day, I don't know, the engineers can work their magic. I used to have a CD copy of it. I can't find that at three different places where I think it should be. So I can't find that game. But only a few days ago, I was looking for some other material and I stumbled across a, a musical package of some Panthers good moments over five years and stumbled on that. So, so that's the only version at the moment. Um, so if anyone's got a version, let me know. Um, but, but, but yeah, what, what a moment. And, and it was it was so special. Uh, I mean, that commentary, I'll, I'll let you into a little secret. I think it was before I'd, I'd actually got my glasses. I knew that my sight wasn't amazing. And, and, and in Sheffield, you sit up commentary high on the far opposite side to where the Panthers fans sit. It's so high. Yeah. Uh, and I was probably 60% certain that it was Kim Arus who'd scored. I thought it was a six or a nine. And I was pretty certain it wasn't David Struish. And in that moment, that instant, I'm like, yeah, that's our route. And I, and I thank God I caught it right, because if I'd have got that wrong, it would have been horrendous. <laughs> and I am a little bit disappointed, because you'll hear in the commentary, because Coy Venora, you, you hear me describe the play, but the pass comes to, to Coy Venora, who makes that great play. And I didn't pick up it was Coy Venora, because of his, the way he was, because, again, you, you sit so far up, it's so hard sometimes to pick out the players. And you learn... When you cover a team, maybe their skating style or or something. But if you can't see their number, if you can't see their face, you have to pick up on, on other things. And I remember the way it came to Koi Venora in an instant. So I kind of regret not at the time mentioning Koi Venora. If you go on on that clip, I think myself and Ashley Tate talk about the past. Um, but yeah, Koi Venora made that, that, that really, really good play. It, it was a fantastic goal. And I got a lot of stick, I think, from the Canadians because an ice hockey phrase is backdoor, isn't it? But yeah. in football, you'd say Big back stick. stick. And, this, yes. and this was my first major game. I'd, I'd done a few, you know, maybe the odd commentary online, but it was my first, obviously, major game, which is one of the reasons why it's my special game. So I said back stick. But I remember a lot of the Canadians and, and Kim Arus getting to hear this commentary. And they were just like, what's a back stick? <laughs> and I'm like, what's the back door? And they're like, well, why didn't you say back door? And I'm like... I'm, I'm a British guy, so uh, that caused a bit of merriment. But yeah, what a great night it was! It ended that drought of of so six, many six years. Six years, yes, yeah, six, six years. years without a trophy. It was my first big game as a, as a commentator, so that was very special. Forest were playing that night, so we were doing it live on online um, in the early days. You know, very early days of, of online commentary and reports on the radio. So it was special for that reason. And it was just a great team. Again, it, it probably didn't have the talent of the Sheffield team, which also won the league in the playoffs that year. I mean, Nottingham and Sheffield dominated, didn't they? Yeah. Sheffield won 2-1 in the playoff final. Nottingham finished second to Sheffield in the league. There was only a goal in it in the Challenge Cup. But they were such a close group of players, by and large, that they, they socialised together, whether it be day or night. I have a slightly, you know, get to know a few people and, and see people on a daily basis when I do my role. And I've worked with many teams and I've the privilege to, to work with many teams. And I've not known many teams closer than that, that 2003 four team. As I said, it, it was great to end the drought. It was a special personal moment. And they were such a great group of guys uh, and they deserved it. And, and it was just really special to be, to be able to commentate on that game and, and to win it in Sheffield. The first time Nottingham had beaten Sheffield in a, in a, in a major final. It was, you know, it's a very special one. And there's been massive games since. I mean, I, I could have put down the game where Rasto made all the, the penalty saves. That was massive as well. But this one for being the first for, for six years just, just pipped it for me. It was 3-2. The, the game finished and Panthers took an early 2-0 lead. Eric Anderson scores a double, brings it back to 2-2, which takes it into overtime. But everyone focuses in on that Alrus goal at 60-53. Every, everybody who was there, everybody who was around at that time can give the time of that goal hmm. straight away. And it, it was, and I remember being in the crowd at Sheffield that night and there was a group of us and we just all went absolutely crazy when that goal went in. I can imagine. And I remember looking at, you know, my, my first... My eyes are on the play. And, and if you look back, there's a very grainy video on, on YouTube, which I found recently, of the overtime goal. And 
it, it's a perfection of overtime. I don't Sheffield. I don't think bear if they touched the pocket it was once. And Panthers just rotated it from back to front. You watch, that is a lesson in, in how to play overtime. And it was fantastic the way the move developed. And as I say, I, I, I called the goal, saw the players go and celebrate in the corner. And then my next eyes were on the Panthers fans. My family were in there. So that was very special as well. A lot of friends, of course, who have become great friends over the years covering the Panthers. I knew they were sitting in, you know, well, by then, you know, like you said, you guys were jumping up and down. So it was very, very special to, to call that moment and then just to look at the joy, what it meant. You could, ju- you know, it, Panthers weren't used to beating Sheffield in, in a final. You know, it, it just, you know, the year before they'd lost, hadn't they, in the, in the Manchester Arena, 3-2, I think it was, yeah. uh, when they were 3-0 yeah. down and got two late goals, perhaps, and, and just couldn't put it back. And that's, that. You know, I mean, I think I did commentate on a period of that game. Colin Frey had, had two periods, I think, of, of that one. But, but yeah, it, it was just a feeling that you just weren't used to as a, as a, a Panthers fan and as a Panthers reporter, and, and that made it so special. Little postscript from that game. Uh, was it Christian Bronsard was the Steelers netminder? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And who who had signed for Panthers at, at one point, and then it, it all fell through. And then I think a season later, he finds himself in Sheffield. Yeah, that's a mid-season right. signing. That was the only game he lost in yeah, Sheffield. Yeah, <laughs> I, I heard that not so long ago as well. That's an amazing stat, isn't it? Mm. And also, uh, Mike Blaisdell blamed Diana Ross. That's Two right. Yeah. Because the ice. He said something about, oh, it, you know, the, the ice was bad because of Diana Ross concert the night before, where it was the same for both sides, Blazer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, not, like Sheff- were, not like Sheffield. <laughs> so not like Sheffield to find an excuse uh, for well, losing, is it? They weren't used to it, were they? They weren't, they weren't used to it. And, and, and that, that kind of started, uh, it's not a period of dominance, but, it, you know, because Sheffield kind of hit back a couple of years later with a couple of bigger wins, but... You know, that, that I think that sowed the seeds for, for Nottingham to realise they could beat Sheffield in a final. And Corey Nielsen be, kind of became a big thing of that when he became coach. Yeah. Well, that leads us in beautifully to defenceman number two. So, Chris, who is yeah. defenceman number two? Corey Nielsen. <laughs> it is, of course, Corey Nielsen. From 2006-07 to 2017-18, where he finished as coach. 403 games for the Panthers in all competitions. 85 goals, 300 assists. One Elite League title, five playoffs, seven Challenge Cups, one Continental Cup. 14 trophies in 12 seasons. I'm sure I don't really have to ask this, but Chris... Why Corey Nielsen? You, you've kind of summed it up. Corey Nielsen is one of the best things ever to happen to the Nottingham Panthers. He's got his critics, and, and I can't believe that. And, and we'll come on to a bit later, I think, on, on other bits and bobs. So I, I'll, I'll leave that there. But he came to the Elite League, didn't he? And, and I don't know whether this was a, a Mick Holland, let's say, a piece of work, it was, or whether the headline, or whether maybe Gary Moran has said it. But, but poor old Corey Nielsen. And you, you probably remember this, Jono. Too good for the Elite League, I think, maybe was a, a big headline or Mike something. Ellis. Like, whether you remember that one? It was Mike Ellis who said it. So it was Mike Ellis who said it. Did mm. Mike Ellis say it? Did someone say it for him? Not sure. Don't know. But I remember that 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 being a. And I felt for Corey there. You know, maybe Mike did say it. You know, but but I just remember that headline, and I felt for him. You know, at, at the time, that was a massive thing to come in. So the moment he came in, him, the Panthers fans, and the other fans in the league. You know, the Panthers fans expected. The other fans in the league obviously wanted to see him fail because, you know, that's just the nature of, of sport. And, and again, in his first season, he, he had it tough. I mean, you, you look at his first season, he's got 42 points in, in 54 games in, in league play. Uh, that's great for a defenseman. He's, he's one of the best defensive defensemen uh, that, I, that I've seen play in, in Panthers colours. He was fantastic. You know, he gets in my all-star team as a player. He'd get it in as a coach as well. His, his career didn't last long enough as a player for me. You could see by the end of it, influence was waning, you know, becoming a player coach had taken its toll on him. And probably the older he got, the more injuries he's got. But he was fantastic as a player. His shot, his vision. I mean, I've mentioned this before on podcasts, but a, but a, but a, a pass to pick out Jade Galbraith in a playoff semi-final to Belfast, which ultimately we lost on penalties, but it was Panthers one, they were down with about five to go. He picked a pass out to send Jade clear. Yeah. Jade ring length. Ring yeah, length pass. Absolutely and, and incredible. That, yeah. 
yeah, and, and that kind of summed him up. His, his vision was great. His goal scoring was great. Some criticised him defensively. I thought he was solid. Yeah, you know, he coughed the puck up, but he was on the puck all the time. Corey Nielsen liked it to be about Corey Nielsen. He's not going to deny that. And he wanted to be the best player. Uh, so he was always on the puck. I mean, I hear the same arguments about Ben O'Connor. Some people say, oh, Ben O'Connor makes a lot of mistakes in a game. Well, maybe he does, but he's always on the puck. He's always on the power play. But you know full well Ben O'Connor will 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 win you a game as he helped turn around many games for GB. I know I'm digressing, but they're, they're similar players. Um, but, but Corey Nielsen as a player was a joy to watch. And, and I remember again that, that first season. And I, I don't think he'd taken... If he'd taken a penalty shot in the season, it might have been won in a, in a game that Mike Ellis had trusted him with. And it was that, again, here we go to Sheffield again. It was the away leg, wasn't it, of that two-legged quarterfinal, the yeah, first exactly. leg. Where that was, that was the Red... first year they'd done it, wasn't it? And that was the first year of the two, two-legged quarterfinal. Well, well that's, a good, that's a good memory. I mean, I remember, Ray, my memory, it's the first leg, Reagan Derby coming down from up high to have a fight, you know, jump into the... <laughs> Steelers bench, yes. then yeah. into the Dave Pay photography bench. Then, as I say, then punches. Well, I mean, I know I'm digressing, but he he offers out the Panthers bench. Danny Myers asked him to get on the Panthers bench. Instead, he punches Ryan Schmier. Schmier defends himself. And I remember the Panthers being worried because um, they thought Schmier might get banned because he punched someone off the ice who wasn't a player. But clearly, this this Reagan Derby started it. But that, that was a, a tremendous uh, two-legged affair, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Sheffield came back a few times. Um, but, yeah, my point about Corey Nielsen was in that penalty shootout in the second leg, you can again, there's some commentary that we did online, and you can hear it in my voice. It goes, next penalty shot is Corey Nielsen? And uh, he went backhand top shelf, scored. Yeah, took did took it, it wonderfully, yeah. Yeah, did it in the semi-final. Didn't do it in the final. Well, he tried. He did the same move in the final, but his old teammate, Phil Azur, obviously knew his move and made the save. But yeah, so again, that was a defining moment for me in that first season for, for Corey Nielsen. He scored that backhand penalty and surely anyone who criticised him at that point would have forgotten about it as Panthers <laughs> stormed their way into the semis and then ultimately won it. And you could see he was a studious guy. You know, I was fortunate enough again to interview him on regular occasions as a player and pick his brain. And it wasn't just a standard ice hockey interview with cliches. There was a bit more to him. And, and while I was a little bit shocked to see Mike Ellis go after two seasons, I wasn't stunned when, when the, you know, the name, you know, literally within a day or so, Corey Nielsen was named coach. And what an era it was. Like you say, 14 trophies in 12 seasons. Some of those just as a player, but the vast majority of those as coach. And I think you're right in what you say. He changed the Nottingham Panthers for the better. Yeah, absolutely. He, he gave them this winning mentality that, that had never been there before. Yes, poor lady started it. Mike, I mean, Mike Ellis, to be fair, he won, he won two in two years. He's very unlucky. Yeah, that was the first, the first time it had been done in the modern era where Panthers have won yeah. two trophies in consecutive seasons. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. He won two in two years. You could argue his, his league campaigns as a coach were, weren't that great, but who's were really apart from Corey Nielsen in the famous 2012, 2013 year, there's not mm. many, many coaches that have, have come that close. I mean, put in at that poor lady in, in 2003, four year Panthers finished second. Well, they, apart from the year they won it, they haven't got much closer since, yeah. have they? No. So, you know, for whatever reason, and, and, you know, Dave Sims always asks me about that, whether it's on a phone call or on a podcast or whatever, and that's probably a debate for a, a different broadcast altogether. But no, Corey Nielsen brought a, a winning mentality to the Panthers. It started as a player. It continued as a player coach. It, it continued very much so as a coach only. And, and look, you know, Corey Nielsen's left this club now. And the club's been on a barren run. Is is it a coincidence? I'm not so sure. This year could have changed things. You know, we will never know. I would have loved to have seen this team play in the playoffs. But no, Corey Nielsen single-handedly changed this. Well, not single-handedly, but him and many others. But he was the man at the forefront. And and, And he brought Panthers success. The run of success, they may never see again because, you know, Cardiff, are a big force now. And even without Andrew Lord, I'm sure they will be a strong force. Belfast and Sheffield, always strong. You know, that era of dominance under Corey Nielsen, I'm not sure we'll ever see again. 
Okay, we will leave the defensive pairing there and move on to opposition players who you would love to have seen for the Panthers. Now, we've changed the rules slightly and we've allowed you two. So, Chris, you've gone with two. Who are they? Well, my two are from the same team, effectively, really, in the kind of biggest parts of their career. One still with his team now. That's Jonathan Phillips and Ryan Finnerty. So Jonathan Phillips and Ryan Finnerty. Ryan Finnerty, probably better known with the Sheffield Steelers, but also had a spell with the Cardiff Devils as well. Jonathan Phillips, uh, as well as a spell at Cardiff early in the Elite League era, is known mainly for being the Steelers captain and a successful Steelers captain for many, many years. So let's start with Jonathan Phillips. Why, Why him in particular? Again, Jonathan Phillips, when, when you talk about players with respect in the game, there's very few that has the respect of, of Jonathan Phillips. I mean, the Welshman has made Sheffield his home. He, again, I talk about Corey Nielsen being one of the key factors behind Nottingham success. Look at a key factor and someone who goes back years and year again. Jonathan Phillips, he is a type of coach's dream. You could put him on a top line and he'd play a role. He'll quite happily play a role on a fourth line. He'll go out and play on a power plate. He'll go out and play on a penalty kill. He, he sets the examples that other players will follow. Uh, and Sheffield have been very lucky to have him. I'm, I'm very sad that, that he never played for Nottingham. He's a player I think would have been fantastic for Nottingham. You know, we, we have David Clark and we'll, we'll come on to him later. Different type of player to Jonathan Phillips. We've been blessed with a lot of offensive players, In I feel, in in you know you look down our list and there's a lot of great offensive players but for defensive forwards they don't I don't feel Nottingham have had loads of, of them in in years not successful ones anyway but but Jonathan Phillips fabulous captain I've got to know him obviously well through my with my Great Britain hat on again leads by example there he he just is everything you want in a player and as I say can play so many roles across a team and it's no surprise that Sheffield pretty much consistently win. I mean, okay, the last few years haven't been so good until this year, but he's won stacks of trophies with them and and he's just a top quality player. Yeah, I'd I'd agree with you. A player I would have at the Panthers in an absolute heartbeat. The second player is Ryan Finnerty, a player I admit I hated when he played uh, and we we have a laugh about it now when I I see him about how much I hated him as a player. Uh, But another player who I would have had in the Panthers side in a heartbeat. So why particularly Ryan Finnerty for you? Well, you've kind of, you know, you've started to answer the question yourself there, Jono. He is the type of player that, that other fans hated and everyone in Nottingham hated him. Why did they hate him? Well, I mean, he, he used to get under the skin, but also he, he'd score huge goals. And, you know, again, Finity wasn't known for his offensive skills. He was no Jay Galbraith. But again, that's what, you know, I feel Nottingham lacked a lot of defensive forwards that could play that role. He was, I mean, one man who did it well was, was Bruce Richardson and he was very similar to him. And the, the two of them got under each other's skin and, and they had some terrific fights mm. um, and they were very similar players, but I'd love to have seen Ryan Finity do what he did for Sheffield for the Nottingham Panthers. And again, he could, he could score big goals, probably wasn't going to waltz his way through every player on the ice, but he'd go and get dirty. And, and that's what, Hockey isn't just about those those breathtaking moments. It's about the moments that, that where someone just goes to work and work and work, and that and that's what Ryan Finity did. I mean, I told a story on a on a Steelers podcast recently. He did come quite close to signing for Nottingham one year, midway through a season when I think he'd gone back to to North America, probably before he, he ended up in Cardiff, if if my yeah. memory serves me right. Uh, and there was every chance that Nottingham were going to get him. It didn't quite work out. And I remember the time being really disappointed that that he wasn't going to come because I think he'd be one of those players who, if he had signed for Nottingham, those cheers would have soon turned to cheers. And, and he would have been a great asset to the to the franchise. But again, it's just that type of player. Yes, it's great to watch Jade Galbraith dance around players and Jordan Fox take on the whole of the Sheffield d- defence and forwards and score wonder goals. But at the same time, to, to see a guy just give everything, um, and that's not to say those players I mentioned didn't always give everything, but just to see a player just do those dirty things, that's fantastic. And maybe over the years, I feel that, not, I mean, there's, 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 there's plenty of names, but I just feel maybe Nottingham have, have been lacking in that area. And Infinity was one of them, and I just think he would have been greatly suited to, to the Nottingham Panthers. 
OK, we're going to go back to your team now, starting with your forward line. So who is your first forward? My first forward is David Clark. David Clark, nothing but a Nottingham Panthers legend with 799 games, 393 goals, 384 assists for 777 points, 14 seasons, multiple trophies and was recently inducted into the British Ice Hockey Hall of Fame as well. I chose David Clark for my team. Why have you chosen David Clark for yours? He's as much Nottingham Panthers from Peterborough as Jonathan Phillips' is Sheffield Steelers from, from Wales. This young lad came to Nottingham in 2003. I remember interviewing him outside the Corner House. Panthers have just announced a deal with Corner House and this young lad did an interview with me and, and never believed on that day in 2003 that all these years later, the guy would still be connected with the Nottingham Panthers. His, his shirt hangs in the rafters. Again, a very different type of player to, to Jonathan Phillips. And, you know, they're best pals as well. They're really close friends. Clarkey was the more offensive player. And again, he did the things that you just watched and, and you loved. Uh, and that's not to say that he, he wouldn't get himself dirty because, you know, you. and again, I'm going to list reasons. He had a fight. The day Nottingham Panthers needed to win the title in Belfast, Clarkey, who's one of the, the top goal scorers in Elite League history, has a fight. Yeah, uh, first and to period. Me, that just, yeah, that, that just sums it up. I mean, you know, he could do that. He had to fight. I mean, he'll admit, as a British youngster growing up in the Super League era, and there was very few British players that were in the Super League era, to get noticed, he had to fight. Coaches wanted him to fight. So he had that side to his game. But he was clearly a natural goal scorer from the minute he played in his first season, in that season that, you know, Panthers won the, the Challenge Cup, which I talk about. And he just knew how to score big goals. He, he scored in that, that Ch- Challenge Cup final, the first leg, uh, when we drew one all with the Steelers at the National Ice Centre before Aru scored in that, in that second leg. He, he scored in the playoff final of 2007 when Rasto made all those saves on penalty shots. He scored that empty net goal a few years later in the in the 2-0 win over the Cardiff Devils. He just knew how to score big goals. I, I often mention this. Simsy, David Sims, just would, would say Clarkey will always score against the Sheffield Steelers. And I've seen a lot of players who have scored stack loads of points for the Panthers but couldn't do it against the Steelers for whatever reason in the big game. But Clarkey could quite easily score four against Edinburgh on a Tuesday night in Edinburgh to get a hat-trick against the Steelers in, in the biggest game of the season. Yeah. Uh, and he led by example. You know, he was captain for many years. He was great on the ice, fantastic with fans on the ice, a fantastic ambassador for the club. I was very honoured and very lucky to work on his testimonial, and it was the first of, of four that have been involved in. And the amount of people with Clarkey that he just picked up the phone, sent him email, said, would you do this for Clarkey? Yeah, no problem. And and it was a real eye opener. I mean, I knew full well how well liked Clark he was by Nottingham and not just ice hockey fans in Nottingham, but the, the wider sporting public, the contacts he had in sporting stars in Nottingham, people that played other sports that knew him and liked him. People, do you know what I mean? People that didn't really know ice hockey, but had come across him from a promo or from something else. Basically, Clarkey had time for everyone. That continues, I'm sure, to this day, because I've seen him turn up at the rink since and spend ages signing autographs or having a chat. You know, the, the guy bled Nottingham Panthers. Not only did it work on the ice for him, but he was a leader of it. And I could go on and on and talk about David Clark. See a British player that will hit the heights for Nottingham that David Clark did. Yeah, and I think you've covered pretty much everything. <laughs> everything everything I was going to add, there's and nothing to go, add to we that. we could go on. <laughs> yeah, we, we could. We could go on. There's so many things. And and again, they're missing, they're missing David Clark right now, the Panthers. And he's not been adequately replaced. Brit Pack Panthers have got, there's some great talent in there. But there's not a David Clark at the moment. And and, and he's a massive loss for the Panthers and and. You know, you you know more than me as a young lad called Hopkins, isn't there? In the in the Nottingham Junior system, and maybe yes. he's the next David Clark, Jack, Hock, uh, Jack, Jack Hopkins. Jack Hopkins, it? yes, That's yeah. It. And maybe he's the new. I mean, I'm pinning my hopes on you, Jack. If you're listening, <laughs> no um, pressure, Jack. But, yeah, <laughs> no pressure. But yeah, but but Clarkey was one one of a kind, and, and I say him hanging up his boots. It, it, I just you know, his skate, should I say, is still being felt now. 
So we'll leave David Clark there and move on to your favourite goal. So, Chris, what is your favourite goal? Well, my favourite goal is a Jordan Fox against Sheffield S <laughs> goal. But I think it's even better. John Purvis, what a great player he was. It was away in the Super League year, the last year of the Super League, away to the London Knights. Now, I commentated on the game for, for Radio Nottingham, but it was in the, in the days where we did a lot of internet commentaries only. I, I can't find any sort of audio of this game. I seem to remember there was a video that I found some time ago on YouTube of this goal. I now can't find it. I've searched high and low. But basically, it was away in London. Could have been the league season. Could have been the playoff group stages. I really can't tell you. There'll be fans out there listening that I'm sure will remember it. But it was like Jordan Fox's, but better. I felt like he took it around the, the London team twice. He went from one end of the ice to the other. It was very Jordan Foss-esque for people that know that one. So that will give you an indication. Uh, it could have been shorthanded, but it was out of this world. It was just, it, it, it was just like... No one could touch him. Uh, and another one of my favourite goals was, was Purvis in that playoff semi-final where Nottingham lost with point two to London uh, in the playoff semi-final when he broke away shorthanded uh, and scored a fantastic goal. That was a great shorthanded finish. I still haven't uh, got over that game all these years later. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. And I tell you what, and another thing, I'm commentating on that game with, with Brent Pope on Radio Nottingham. And the noise... Of the, the goal going in, me shouting, Brent Pope going, wow, it took the ICN, it took the connection down. <laughs> so it, it, the pass comes to the back stick, should I say, to the back door, doesn't it, before it gets put in. Um, my commentary stops before it goes in. It's that moment where it's about to go in. But anyone listening will have no clue. And the line just goes down. This is live radio. <laughs> and so frantically, I mean, an ICN is like a big telephone box but a quality line and I'm dialing the number back to the studio. And then 30 seconds later, 45 seconds later, I have to kind of pick up and go, uh, well, welcome back. The game's over. That went in. Nottingham Panthers are out, um, which may have helped really. That I didn't have to sort of describe that the final moments after the goal went in. I mean, it was a horrendous time that when for the technology to fail us, but no, that that's final, the semi-final where, Purvis scored a great shot. It put Nottingham ahead, didn't it? 3-2. Yep. And that goal, I thought, was going to see Nottingham into the final. Um, but I digress a bit again there. But the, the goal he scored in either the regular season or, or the, the, the group stages, as it was then, was fantastic. I think I found it once before. I found it again. And, and if I can, then I'll make sure you can post it out, Jono. But it was, it was brilliant. It was, you know, it was one of the best goals I've ever seen. Jordan Fox uh, obviously nearly, well, replicated it, basically. But but this one for memory. Maybe memory has kind of clouded it and it wasn't as good as I thought. But it definitely, there'll be people out there that remember it. It was absolutely fabulous. Great stuff. So, that again, you're very good at this. Because we're going <laughs> to lead into your next forward now. So, There's who is? Who is well, you're for... the producer here, so. <laughs> <laughs> who is forward oh, number great. two? Forward number two is Jordan Fox. Jordan Fox. So, two seasons for the Panthers in 2011-12 and 2012-13. 135 games in all competitions, 46 goals, 112 assists for 158 points overall. One Elite League title, two Challenge Cups, two playoffs. And, of course, he was captain in that glorious 2012-13 season. So, why Jordan Fox? Well, again, I mean, his, his record on the ice and what you've just described speaks to itself. You know, I can't think of many outskaters that, that spent sort of only a couple of years at the Panthers that, that made such an impact in, in such a short space of time. It was clear, wasn't it, from that 2011-12 season that this guy had talent. You know, he, he, he could do a bit of everything, didn't, couldn't he? He was so skillful. His hands unbelievable and typified by that that goal that that many people just drawn about even now against the Sheffield Steelers and again he would he would get involved he didn't mind having the odd fight he led by example and it was no surprise when he was made captain in 2012-13 and again for such an offensively gifted player he is that type of player that would get in the dirty corners and would grind it out whereas some skilled offensive players perhaps would be less keen to do that. And, and again, is there any kind of, you know, the, the, the move that Corey made by putting him on defence? Again, a, a player like Jordan Fox, he might have sought, couldn't he? He could have said, well, 
no, I'm not. I'm not going to do that. I don't want to play on defence. But who knows how the conversation went? But I'm sure knowing Jordan Fox, he just went whatever it takes. I'm sure that's what he said. Whatever it takes, and you can tell yeah. by chatting to him since he didn't mind. He he would do anything for the team. And ultimately, it, it's it's those sort of decisions that to me that set the example for the team. You know, you've got your captain here, one of your leading point scorers in the league the year before. Well, I'm now he's now going to play D because that's for the benefit of the team. I mean, I think it must have been D, John where he scored that wonder goal. From. It was, it yes, he was playing night. on defence, yeah. He was on defence that night, which is probably, may never have happened if he'd been a forward because he may not have picked the puck up in that position. Hmm. But he was a fantastic captain. You know, we all remember his speech after that loss to Edinburgh at home. Yes. Uh, yeah. 2-1 again. I mean, the, the, these memories come flooding back. You know, he, he took it. He came out and he the fans wanted to hear it. But again, it wasn't one of those interviews where you think, ah, he's just saying it to appease the fans. You could see he meant it. You could see you could see in the emotion and the way he conducted himself in that interview, you could see what it meant to him. And you could see how he knew it was unacceptable for the players and how he was telling the players it was unacceptable. And I just wish he could, again, I wish he could have stayed longer. You know, he won what, five trophies with the Panthers in those, in two, in those seasons, two seasons. Yeah. And forward-wise, step back onto defence, I could go on. But but Jordan Fox was another player who set the examples that, that other players should follow. And again, it was no surprise when he was setting those examples that the Panthers team was successful. Yeah, absolutely. OK, we're going to move on to your final forward now. So, Chris, who is forward number three? Kevin Bergen. Kevin Bergen came mid-season 2007-8 and stayed until 2009-10. 172 games in all competitions, 71 goals, 86 assists for 157 points. He won two Challenge Cups with the Panthers in 2008 and 2010. He had spells at the Basingstoke Bison prior to arriving in Nottingham. And he also had a season in Brayhead with the clan. So, Chris, why Kevin Bergen? Well, there's passion and there's passion. And, and then there's a player like Kevin Bergen, just a guy who would go through the wall to to do anything. And and again, I, I come back to the fact that he wasn't short on talent. He could score some great goals. He was a decent passer. He fought. He could play on defence. He had a spell on defence. But to me, it was the passion he brought and the way that players like him. I mean, this selection could quite easily have been Bruce Richardson as, as well, because they were very similar characters. It's no shock that they are now linking up next season to coach together. Bruce has got Bergie on board with him in, in North America, and they've been working together for, for a long time now. But they're on the same team now, which is fantastic. But to hear him talk, to meet his family, especially his dad, the, the passion of Kevin Bergen, just to hear him talk now, and he did that piece with with Dan on on Panthers TV a, a week or so ago. It's it's that passion, and and you don't see that often enough now in this era. Don't get me wrong; it's still there, and you still see it. But I, I digress from Kevin Bergen specifically. But his era with Bruce Richardson and, and people like that was the last time I felt there was really a truly massive Panthers Sheffield rivalry. Don't get me wrong, I'm not dismissing it now. It's still the biggest game of the season. But but that rivalry and the reason for that rivalry was because people like Bergie, they didn't just believe in the hype. They didn't like these players who they were playing because they'd heard about them. They 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 knew that they that they were the Steelers and the, and their paths may have crossed in another league somewhere before. But they, they wanted to beat them because they were Nottingham and this was Sheffield. And it wasn't some sort of pantomime rivalry. To, to these guys, it, it meant everything. I remember a game in Sheffield. We lost on penalty shots. Bergie took three penalties, missed them all. And, and that night he was devastated. We spoke after the game uh, and we spoke the next day as well. And they didn't play the next day. And I remember speaking to him, you know, the next afternoon. And he, he was still hung up on it then. He, he, he was so upset that he'd missed three penalties. He wasn't the only one who missed penalties in that shootout, but he blamed himself. He said, if, if, if I could have scored a, a penalty shot, we would have won that game. It just meant everything. You saw in his celebrations the, the Bergy yeah. bounce. Playing for the Nottingham Panthers meant everything for him. And, and he just he gave it all. He'd fight. He fought Sean McMorrow. 
Uh, who was that lad in the other lad in Belfast? That that really tough, tough lad that he fought. That that you know, ultimately, you think was, was a heavyweight, and perhaps someone. You know, I mean, Berg is a tough, tough lad, mm. but he, you know, he would fight anyone while not being a true out and wild. You know, I mean, heavyweight. I don't like using that frame. It's probably a, a bit disrespect to Bergie to, to not call him that. But you had the Sean McMarrow type characters, didn't you? Who who were there to fight? Bergie was there for for so much more. I think that's what I'm trying to say. But but he would fight anyone. Mm. He'd do anything for the Nottingham Panthers, and and he just brought so much enjoyment uh he remains a good friend to a lot of people in nottingham another person who, who comes back regularly to visit and again players like him were a joy to watch and as the ultimate honor of having a kebab named after him as well <laughs> yeah absolutely which i think you can still get if you, you can there. still get yes yeah so, so <laughs> it, there you go it's, you, it's you a know, playoff he, weekend favorite that one <laughs> you may not have a shirt hanging up but he got a kebab <laughs> named after him what more can you ask for <laughs> And that completes your team, Chris. So we've got netminder Jordan Willis in defence, Jimmy Pack and Corey Nielsen. And then the forwards are David Clark, Jordan Fox and Kevin Bergen. Uh, quite a good lineup, that. Yeah, I'm quite happy with it. I mean, there's, there's so many people I've missed out. And recently I, I did a, for Radio Nottingham, I did a, a team of the decade. Yeah. 2010 to 2020. For Radio Nottingham, we then did a best ever elite league team. And, and obviously that was a bit easier, both of them, because, well, certainly the um, the, the Radio Nottingham, you know, EIHL best ever team, you were able to get able to get a roster in. So so that was kind of like a lot easier. But but this was hard. But, you know, as I said, there were some names first on the team sheet, but I'm pretty happy with it. It'd be a passionate line. It'd have a bit of everything, goal scoring, hmm. a bit of fighting. In fact, I'm, I'm very happy with that line. I think it would... Uh, be up there with with any of the the best lines in in, in the league, and you know, with each player playing at the top of their powers in in their relevant era. Yeah. Um, but no, it was it was great fun to put together, and, and I say it just it just felt like it got a bit of everything. Well, you mentioned how difficult it was, and there are some honourable mentions. So, who are the players who you considered but just missed out? Well, I, I mean, I could go on forever, and I'll, and I'll try and be brief. But but John Purvis again, mm-hmm. we've touched on him. Another player, I'd love to see him at his peak. He just came a bit late, really. He clearly got the skills. If we'd seen him a couple of years earlier, I think it'd have been massive for, for the Nottingham Panthers. David Struish as well, another player who led by example. Uh, I got to know David in the Elite League era in, in that year again when Nottingham won the Challenge Cup with Kim Arus getting that goal. I don't think he wore a letter in that year off the top of her head. I, I might be wrong because he may well have been assistant player coach to Paul Lady that year. Um, but he didn't need a letter. Everybody respected him. And, and I'll tell you a little story about uh, David Struish, which, again, sums David Struish up. We lost to London that year, you know, London Racers. Yeah. In, not Ali Pali, Lee Valley. It handed the title to Sheffield. That, that was the game, was yeah, it? Yeah, I, I was there. <laughs> OK, um, well, me too. But, 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 you know, handing titles to Sheffield game do seem to blur into one, sadly. <laughs> After that game, David Struish, I was driving home and David Struish texted me uh, and said, sorry, you had to watch that. I just wanted to apologize. That just summed the guy up. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I was a reporter for the team. I, you know, I, yes, I'd built up a friendship with him. Um, but, but there he was sending a text. And, and, you know, I was like, you don't need to apologize. These things happen. But, but again, that, that just summed up David Struish. He, he, he wore his heart on his sleeve. Uh, I remember his dad tuned into the broadcast when we won the night in Sheffield. His dad had discharged himself from hospital, I think, to be able to listen to the game. And again, you could tell just from his dad's email where David got all his characteristics from uh, and how he was. So again, uh, another great player in Nottingham's history. Uh, Danny Myers, I feel bad that Danny didn't feature in this team or in my best ever EIHL team. He probably should have done. The guy... Jono, I know you had a lot of dealings with him as yep. well, and, and you, you know, you'll back me up. Another player who bled black and gold. And it was interesting listening to the to the Sheffield best ever team and their conversations because the minute he became a Steeler, he, he did the same for them. And, and Danny just would would always stand up and be counted when things weren't going great. Great, and he led the team fantastically. He was great with the fans. Always had time for the fans. Uh, and and to say, I mean, he. I feel sad. He, he he was part of the the era that kind of started to build that dominance. Okay, he went and 
and, and didn't win the league title that year. And I'm, I'm really sad for him. But he, but he was part of that building process. So, so he deserves a lot of credit for the way he led the team and kind of started the building blocks for me. Bruce Richardson, I kind of touched on him in my answer about Kevin Bergen. Very similar, passionate type of players. Just everything you want to see. You know, you can see why he was a fan's favourite. Could score, could assist, could fight. Was passionate. You know, no surprise he was loved in Brayhead when he went there. And no surprise to see he's doing well now uh, in his coaching career. Again, another guy, maybe one day he'll be coach of the the Nottingham Panthers. Uh, And Matthew Myers, what a great player he was for the Nottingham Panthers. He turned up every single night. He never had a night off. He, again, might not have been in the most flashy of players, but he just, every single night, he wouldn't care whether it was... Edinburgh away on a miserable Tuesday night and he had to get into the corner with someone he'd never heard of or playing the biggest game of the year. Uh, Matthew Myers was fantastic. He had a number of spells here uh, and clearly he wanted to move back to Cardiff with and be with the family there to, to kind of finish his career there. But again, another player I wish we could have held on for, for a couple of more years because he, he was a fantastic servant to the Panthers and, and, and a joy to watch. Out of all those, who was the closest to making it in? Who was the one that you Ooh. found really difficult to leave out? Oh, that's a that's a really good question. Probably Bruce Richardson, really. Mm. Bruce Richardson was, was probably one of the closest because him and, and Hingham Bergie, French Canadians, cut from the same cloth really, you know, for Kevin Bergen you could you could almost say Bruce Richardson. Um they were very similar characters indeed. I would say Bruce Richardson. But look, this list has got one, two, three, four, five names on. Mm. I wish I could have given you 50, but I'd have been <laughs> boring everyone by now. I mean, you know, so yeah, you have to be harsh. There's there's plenty of yeah. players that, that, that won't make it. But but yeah, but I, I pondered long and hard about, about Bruce Richardson. So uh, I think he came closest. And I, and I did want to find a way for, for David Struish because he said this to me is about players that not only have impacted like players I've loved watching, but have kind of had an impact on me personally as well yeah uh, and there's loads of names that i've left out you know in in that in that front but yeah probably bruce the closest okay we are going to finish the show as we always do with your favorite moment so in all the time that you've been supporting and covering the nottingham panthers what is your favorite moment Corey nielsen shirt retirement Corey nielsen shirt retirement as panthers were presented with the league trophy on the 22nd of march 2013 after a game against the cardiff devils There was another surprise as Corey Nielsen's 77 shirt was retired. So, Chris, why is that particularly your favourite moment? I'll go to what I kind of alluded to at the start of all, at the start. You know, Corey Nielsen was the main driving force between turning this this franchise around to to what it achieved in in that era of unprecedented success. Uh, And... I, I don't think it's a, a secret because the story's been out there before, but Corey's tough times as a coach. Fans got on his back. His family had rubbish thrown at them. You know, they were leaving the, the ice rink and, and they had rubbish thrown at their car. His wife and, and two, at that time, young sons. And, and you know, for such a great fan base as, of ours, uh, we have a yeah, fantastic fan base. That's not on. That, that stuck in my in, in my mind for a long, long time. I, I think it was pre Twitter days. And I'm not the most controversial of, of characters really. Um but but it was something and, 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 and at the time it happened, I, I don't think it was widely known, but but I know it's been touched upon, you know, uh, since uh, and I'm sure Corey's mentioned it. And if he hasn't, apologies Corey. Um but uh, but no, I mean to me, you know, that that's a really sad moment that that anyone connected with the club could have that happen and and he took his critics I mean there was years where we had bad league seasons and and they weren't great and fans wanted him out they wanted rid and he turned it around uh, and I'm so glad that that Neil Black persevered with him it it was a it was an emotional roller coaster you know I'm very lucky to 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 know the family they've got a wonderful family uh, the Nielsen's and it was it was an emotional roller coaster for them so that night I was sat in the box with with his family with with Joanne and it was it was just very emotional uh, it was an emotional moment and 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 why personally for me it was so special just just to see this chap turn up all those years ago as as a player uh, and that journey of, of of you know those people in his first season who wanted Corey Nielsen out as a player 
But, you know, he had the belief and that was the key for for Corey Nielsen. He had the belief in his own ability and the support of his family. And as I say, to kind of witness that not only as a reporter, but as a friend as well, to witness that journey that that he went on and the success that he brought the Nottingham Panthers. And as I say, I, I don't think it will be repeated. And obviously there hadn't been a shirt retirement for, for quite a while. We've seen David Clark since then. But to have that shirt retirement on the night that the team were presented with the uh, the Elite League trophy, you know, you, you couldn't get any, any, any more special, could you? It was an amazing night. And as I say, Corey Nielsen, first as a player uh, and then as a coach, deserves that recognition for what he did for this. You know, he ended that league weight of all those years. A game I didn't go to. That's a that's a different story. <laughs> I watched that on a webcast. But I always I, I tell you what, John, I watch your video a lot. That must that's one of the that must be one of the most what's that eureka moments, John, that you've ever done. The video you, you in the concourse about, after the game in the concourse. Mm, yeah, I probably watch that once every five or six months um, <laughs> to see, to see the delight. You know, and there's a lot of family and friends in that video. And people who I don't know but recognise, and you know, to see that delight, mm. I don't know. I mean, that must have just come to you out the out the blue. We were, were you I, always going to do it. N- no, I had the camera with me because we yeah. we did. We was recording for was we was like doing I'm Cat Switch you TV. Yeah, Here at we that go. time, yeah, with roles yeah. of reverse, and I ran out into the concourse and I said to yeah. Paul, "I'm I'm going to video this. It'd be good filler for the show." So I just mm. stopped, opened the opened the screen and just recorded for and I think it was four and a half minutes of just wave after wave of people coming it, through. It was it was amazing. It was amazing. And 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 that it just showed what it meant. And as I say, Corey Nielsen was was the coach that, that ended that long, long awaited wait for that title, which you can see from that video means so much to so many people. Um and I say to be there in, in you know in the ring to have the you know the league title the, the the retirement shirt presentation i mean there's loads of special memories in panthers history but but emotionally and to see the journey his family went on it was a very special moment i think for for not only for the nielsen's but for the nottingham panthers that night am i right in thinking he had no idea i think you're right yeah i, I certainly had no idea john it's eight years ago yeah. I, I forget <laughs> i i don't think he did no i mean I'd have to ask that. I'd have to ask them, but yeah, I I am pretty certain you are right. I mean, Joanne was one emotional wife that night, as you mm-hmm. as you can imagine. But I, I'm pretty certain because I remember just when it started going, oh my word! And you and you kind of began to kind of realise what was happening. But yeah, yeah, what you know, what, what a night it was to me. That, that there's so many factors, but that era of winning trophies. I mean, Corey Nielsen, basically, if if you want his league record. No one's league record as Panthers coach has been that great in 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 all the time. So it's not a stick you can throw at Corey Nielsen specifically. But if you want a, a coach for a short form tournament, that's where you call on Corey Nielsen. Again, no surprise. Corey Nielsen gets involved with Great Britain. I'm I'm not taking anything away from Pete Russell here, because Pete Russell is is is, is the driving force behind that for for Great Britain and where Pete Russell taken GB. But Corey Nielsen's involvement is massive. The two of them work fabulously with, with Adam Keefe. And, and as I say, and it's another thing. My point there is it's another thing that Corey Nielsen's involved in where short-form tournaments, whatever it is, something he's involved in, he knows how to get the players in the right frame of mind. And what a fabulous place to leave it there. Chris, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thanks for coming on my top line. Thank you, John. I've loved it. And thank you very much to you for listening. We'll be back very soon with another edition of My Top Line. But until then, thanks for listening and goodbye. 